that those being judged have certain normal human reactions, that there is some shared sense of right and wrong, of good and evil. Where an individual lacks these, we may judge them as psychopathic and wonder about, or sociopathic and wonder about their capacity to be judged. Where a society appears systematically to give up those understandings, how to address the perpetrators confident that they could understand the judgment that's being made on them. To be sure, we can punish people in a physical sense, even to death. But is the law able in the process to know it has judged them? How does law judge people who have acted in ways that could be described as barbaric or inhuman, where no dialogue between them and those who stand in judgment appears possible? In past work, I've sought to think this question through in terms of the relationship between law and ethics. The German philosopher Karl Jaspers put it, put, uh, expressed the ideas of guilt in the following terms. He said that legal guilt is a narrow and formalistic practice. That's the thin layer of guilt that is in the law that I mentioned. And the question is, how does it, how, for, question for him, and a question I've taken up, is how does that relate to deeper ethical senses of guilt, such as moral or metaphysical guilt? If legal responsibility talks in terms of positivistic rules and their infraction by formerly free agents, what does this thin legal account of responsibility lack, and how should we seek to address that lack by looking beyond the law? There's a specific legal way of looking at issues of responsibility, which go together to call what I what I call to, to create what I call laws architectonic, a structure of reason and practices grown in a history. But what is there beyond the formal legal structure, laws architectonic, that is needed by it to make sense of its own deeper purpose? Well, a key pair of concepts here that tend to overlap, but which might be worth distinguishing, are those of responsibility and guilt. The plea in the courtroom is guilty or not guilty. For the mad person, for example, it is not guilty by reason of insanity. If asked to explain what law means by these terms, of course, there are factual questions about whether D in fact did, why, but there are also legal normative questions concerning D's responsibility for why. Did D act with the required mental state and with or without defences as provided in law? The word responsible here means something like culpable or blameworthy. These words both draw upon a legal vocabulary and extend across to an extra legal ethical domain. Once we get into culpability or blameworthiness, we're going a little bit beyond the law. In that domain, responsibility as culpability or blameworthiness comes closer to a deeper sense of guilt. That deeper sense is not theorized in law, but it is nonetheless present in the idea of guilt as declared or found in the courtroom. When we see a perpetrator punished for a serious crime, we typically do not think of their punishment as a matter of just a formal sanction for a formally declared infraction of a legal rule. Guilty means something more than this. What do we mean by guilt? And when I say that, I want to get to some kind of sense of what lies both within and outside law, and to see it really as what it is, which I think is a genuinely a feeling of guilt. What is the feeling of guilt? A feeling that links our legal processes, somehow or other, to a sense in the pit of the stomach, not as a thought in the head. In If This Is a Woman, two thoughts, two thoughts emerged for me about the nature of guilt, one concerning the perpetrators, the other the bystanders and observers. So in the camp. With regard to the perpetrators, the thought concerns the basic moral capacities of these people. Were they cut from the same cloth as the rest of human life? Or were they different from the start, in some way morally deficient? The camp personnel were often local women, recruited by the promise of a career, of good work conditions and pay, and a smart uniform. Some probably had sadistic tendencies, and these, of course, would have been encouraged and developed. Some were known by inmates as beaters. 
but others were not. In other times and places, some of these women would conceivably have led quite different lives, ones that did not bring them to the attention of the world. After the war, some sought forgiveness for what they had done, but others did not. Some, no doubt, were trying to save their skins. The first camp commandant was known as a committed Nazi and anti-Semite, yet sought to carry out her role with a degree of moderation. <coughs> After the war, she sought absolution. Another senior guard, who was known for her cruelty, stated prior to her execution that she hoped you won't think we were all evil people. How she could even have said this, given her conduct, is hard to understand. But was there some stirring of conscience? It's entirely possible that many of those who were perpetrators felt no remorse for what they had done, while others may have resorted more or less successfully to various forms of denial. In the latter state, however, there's always something to deny, something that has to be suppressed. How do we understand what that might be? The second thought concerns the bystanders, those who saw what was being done to the women in Ravensbrück as they were marched in and out of the camp. Some resorted to the conventional view that this, these must have been very bad people who had done wicked things and deserved their punishment. Another common reaction, however, was simply to look away and not, and this is the point, to meet the eyes of the inmates. Observers would not take them on, would not recognize them as fellow human beings, but they were, and the need to look away was also an act of denial of the inmates and their humanities. Underlying that was a sense of something held in common. So it was not only a denial of the humanity of the other, but also of their own humanity, that which they held in common with the other. In both situations then, there is a moral affect, a feeling, an emotion that begins to be seen among some of those who acted in such vile ways or observed this happening. And in this paper, that's what I'm going to try and understand through, thinking, through looking at Melanie Klein and Jessica Benjamin. So let me move on to Melanie Klein. My starting point here is a paper that she wrote in 1937 called Love, Guilt and Reparation, which provides a basic rationale for the feeling of guilt, but it needs to be developed. Her emphasis is on the, early phase, the earliest phases in human development which are seen as central to the development of the child, but then the subsequent adult. Love, security, and well-being are felt in the very first interactions between the mother and the child. But in this earliest phase, feelings of love jostle with feelings of anger and hate. The child who is not fed experiences extreme anger and fantasies of destruction of the bad mother. <coughs> love and hate in these early interactions are struggling together in the baby's mind. And this struggle, says Klein, uh, to a certain extent permits, persists throughout life and profoundly influences the course and the force of the emotional lives of grown-up children. <coughs> so the root of Klein's argument is a dialectic of love and hate leading to guilt and reparation. Love and hate are the competing tendencies in the early child. When hate is expressed in fantasy, this leads to anxiety that actual harm has been done to the one that is loved. That anxiety is a form of guilt which the child seeks to address through reparative fantasies, but can never quite get rid of. Such feelings of guilt and the need to repair are therefore, says Klein, more deeply rooted than is usually supposed, and they become a new element integrated into the emotion of love. So love and hate are, are, are combined. Here's a quote from Klein. So side by side with the destructive impulses in the unconscious mind, both of the child and of the adult, there exists a profound urge to make sacrifices in order to help and to put right loved people who in fantasy have been harmed or destroyed. In the depths of the mind, the urge to make people happy is linked up with a strong feeling of responsibility and concern for them, which manifests itself in genuine sympathy with other people and in the ability to understand them as they are and as they feel. So what Klein is, is giving us then is a sense of consideration or compassion that comes from putting ourselves in the place of other people. 
in identifying ourselves with them, we access a capacity for identification with another, which is a most important element in human relationships in general, and a condition for real and strong feelings of love. What starts out in the parent-child bond extends ultimately to all our human relations, so that this making reparation is a fundamental element in love. The resulting dynamic is one in which the child is able to transfer love beyond the mother and onto others in friendship, in education, and broader social relations. A good basis for adult life is therefore given in the early emotional dynamic between parent and child, and the love that commences there. Okay, so that's my starting point in fine. And now I'm going to go on to say something about Jessica Benjamin. So if Klein provides a starting point, I want to add to this the ideas of Jessica Benjamin, whose work in the 1980s in feminist psychoanalysis helps us think through how guilt operates in relation to the harm we do. Benjamin is interested in how we relate to each other and the process of recognition that is involved. The personality of the child evolves through a process of mutual recognition with others, most importantly in the earliest days with those parent figures most closely involved in care. So this is a process of mutual recognition and it represents a sound basis for the development of the child and also the adults caring for it. But it is contrasted with the ways in which mutual recognition may fail and in its place may emerge relations of domination and submission. Benjamin is interested in how a baby develops a sense of self and how this is consolidated or disrupted. A child grows in and through the relationship to others and these others must themselves be selves or subjects in their own right. In this view, a person comes to feel that I am the doer who does, I am the author of my own acts by being with another person who recognizes those acts those feelings, the intentions, the independence of the young person, the difference, the general existence of this young person. At the core of recognition is the need for the differentiation of the child. But the paradox of differentiation is that the child's assertion of itself is only possible through the recognition by another. We need each other for recognition. Recognition is reflexive. It includes not only the other's confirming response, but also how we find ourselves in that response. And that response can only be helpful if it is the response of another who is herself independent. If, for example, a parent lacks independence, she cannot give the child the recognition that it needs for its independence. So, this is, I think, is a really interesting idea. At the core of mutual recognition lies an unresolved tension that takes the form of an openness to another. Mutual recognition requires that in asserting myself, I recognize you as different from me and vice versa. So it holds open a space within me that is for you and you must do the same for me. What is at stake here is not only an understanding of the relationship between parent and child, but something much broader in terms of the nature of adult and social relations in general. To explain this, Benjamin relates her exposition to a very famous moment in West, modern Western political theory. It's the moment in Hegel's phenomenology where he talks about the master-slave dialectic. Now, in Hegel's, this is Hegel's account of, of, of recognition. What he, what he describes in that, in that, in that uh, passage, in the relationship, is two self-consciousnesses who recognize each other, and they recognize the need for each other. Only a self-consciousness has the capacity to recognize another self-consciousness, so they need each other. But at the same time, each self-consciousness sees the other as a threat to its autonomy, and so these self-consciousnesses end up in conflict with each other as each seeks to assert its independence. The result is a life and death struggle in which one wins and the other loses. One becomes the master, the other the slave. 
In this way, a symmetrical relationship of mutual re recognition becomes reshaped into an asymmetrical relationship of dominance and submission, and the value of mutual recognition is lost. The master can no longer draw upon the, the recognition of the other because that other is now his slave, and the slave can no longer draw on the recognition of the master who has defeated him. Recognition of equals becomes transformed into an unequal relation in which one wins and dominates and the other loses and submits. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that this idea of a, a battle between two ways, two psychologies, if you like, one psychology of mutual recognition and another psychology of domination and submission, it lies at the core of our, of, of our understanding of guilt. Okay, let me, let's see how we do this. So, Hegel's outcome is plainly unsatisfactory for all concerned. How can the struggle for recognition be handled better? Benjamin sees sustained mutual recognition as the means of achieving independence in a way that avoids the outcome of Hegel's master-slave dialectic. For Hegel, the mutuality and the relation between the two self-consciousness must break down, but Benjamin sees it differently. The experience of the early child-parent relationship provides a possible, dif a possible different outcome one in which mutual recognition continues. This, is the, this she describes in terms of the early phase of development known as rapprochement of the baby to the parent. Prior to rapprochement, the baby has a sense of omnipotence, a sense that its every demand ought to be met. I think uh, uh, Freud referred to this as the phase of His Majesty the Baby. The outcome of, uh, uh, so, so the baby has a sense of omnipotence, a sense that every demand ought to be met. This places it in conflict with the parent, and rapprochement is the struggle or negotiation that is played out, of, played out in that conflict. The outcome depends on the relationship between parent and child. The first possibility is that the child wins, and the parent continues to accede to its every demand. This looks like a victory for the child but it is the victory of Hegel's master over the slave. To win is to win nothing, and the result is negation, emptiness, isolation. A second possibility is that the parent insists on her own position as against the child, and is intolerant of the child's will. This looks like a victory for the parent, but the result is a child that is suppressed and adapts to its suppression, so never gains independence. So in the first option, the child becomes the master, the parent the slave. In the second, the roles are reversed. In both, a relationship of dominance and submission takes over from one of mutuality and recognition. The third possibility is that the relationship of recognition remains in place. And here's a quote from Benjamin. So in both the first and second cases, the sense of omnipotence survives, projected onto the other, or assumed by the self. In neither case can we say that the other is recognized or that the process of recognition has begun. The ideal resolution of the paradox of recognition is for it to continue as a constant tension, but this is not envisaged by Hegel. The decisive problem remains recognizing the other. Establishing myself means winning the recognition of the other, and this in turn means I must finally acknowledge the other as existing for himself, and not just for me. Okay, and what I'm going to say is, now suggest is that this is a way forward for thinking about guilt. So what, we what do we have from Klein? We have a dialectic of love and hate, leading to guilt and reparation. Guilt is about feeling bad because we hate the one we love, and the desire for reparation follows. This process is deeply ingrained in our being as animals who have been nurtured by each other. Benjamin's idea is that a part of early human development is about being recognized as an individual. That requires a process of mutual recognition in which each must recognize the other. This leads to a tension or anxiety in relation to the other, but that is a good thing. 
The alternative to that tension is a relationship of non-recognition, one of domination and submission. Now, what I want to do is put these two views together, how the feeling of guilt and need for reparation comes out of the love-hate dialectic, and how that feeling might be activated given the two states of being identified by Benjamin, of mutual recognition or of domination and submission. So how do I go about this? Well, my, my argument is, my thought is, that both mutual recognition and domination or submission are accessible to human beings as they interact with others. In general, we have both these mind, mind states that we can, ac we, can both, we can access both these mind states. We're none of us perfect. It would be possible, perhaps, for a person to develop their being in terms of only the mutuality of recognition, or alternatively, pathologically, in terms only of domination and submission. We could wish that the former state was true for all of us, and the latter for none. In reality, however, the likelihood is that we operate between these two states and drift from the one to the other. We are each capable of viewing the other respectfully in terms of mutual recognition, or disrespectfully in terms of subordination, of domination and submission. Further, and this is really important, this occurs in a world that is structured so that relationship may, relationships may be ones of mutual recognition, but they may also be relationships that involve domination and submission. So the social structures of the world that we live in reinforce the existence and the possibility of the two psychological attitudes. The point is that insofar as we experience relationships based on domination and submission, we are nonetheless also aware of the promise and demand of mutuality. And so it's the gap between the two states that is the locus of the feeling of guilt and of thinking reparatively. While I act to dominate or submit, I may be aware that there's another way of acting that makes my domination or submission feel wrong. With regard to situations where I have sought to dominate, I may now feel guilty. In situations where I was myself forced to submit, I may have a sense of injustice that I should be treated in this way. To feel either of these things is possible because part of me, the ground of mutual equality from which I am not acting, 